Thank you very much indeed, Professor Hubner, for that very interesting speech. Ladies and gentlemen, lots of points, lots of challenges to pick up on in all of those opening words. So we're going to proceed now to our panel discussion and joining us to discuss how beer serves Europe today are, and I'll call them up one by one, a former clinical psychologist who joined South African breweries in 1990 as a training and development manager, and he's since held a number of senior positions in that company and was appointed managing director of Saab Miller Europe in 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Alan Clark. Dr. Hans-Georg Eils studied brewing technology in Berlin and started his career at Bex. He's since worked at InBev Germany and is now managing director for brewer operations and logistics at Carlsberg Brewery, and I do stipulate that's Carlsberg with a K, the German company. And since 2011, just June of this year, he's been president of the German Brewers Association. So he's here to give us a hands-on perspective. Welcome. We have some tricky stairs here. Walter de Witt, finally, is a partner at Ernst Young in Amsterdam and has more than 20 years of experience in indirect tax. He specializes in international VAT and customs and has wide experience in issues regarding excise duties here in the EU. He's an associate professor of European tax law at the University of Amsterdam, and he's one of the authors of the report that has already been quoted several times this evening. Please give him a warm round of applause, Walter de Witt. And if we can, I'll just ask you to sit over here, Walter, and we can all take our seats and get going. We've only got water for the beginning of this session, but I think I'll be calling on some beer pretty soon because we'll need to warm up. <laughs> Economic crisis continues to dominate the headlines. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And there is no immediate end in sight. But uh, let me correct that we're not only speaking about one report this evening, the Ernst & Young report on the contribution made, to beer by the, uh, made by beer to the European economy has been mentioned several times, and that report dates from September of this year. It's very recent. But we will also be talking about the May 2011 report on the contribution of brewers to their local communities. So um, obviously the, the big one is the dollars and cents. And Walter David, as the, as the author or one of the authors of the first opus, can you perhaps give us an overview of your findings on the contribution of brewers to the, uh, the European economy? Yes, of course. Um, Maybe you can just turn your microphone. We'll yeah, have to sort of sorry. get adjusted here. Okay, I hope this is better. Uh, yeah, what we found, of course, is uh, that the brewers uh, in Europe uh, have a major contribution to the European economy. It was already memorated by uh, the president of the brewers of Europe, but also by other speakers. Um, uh, for example, 1% of all jobs can, to, to a certain extent, be attributed to the brewing industry. And it's not only the brewers themselves, but also in hospitality, in agriculture and other sectors, um, and also government revenues, of course, we found that uh, 50.6 billion euros a year uh, is um, uh, made by the governments uh, on the brewing industry in, in, and, and also on other sectors dependent on the brewing industry. And that is even an underestimation because for some taxes it was not very uh, easy to find out how much is paid by the the brewing sector, uh, for example, corporate income taxes. Uh, so it's an underestimation. What we also found is, uh, of course, um, uh, but we will speak about that later on, I guess, um, uh, that we see a downward trend. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, perhaps you can just, this report is, is the third of its kind that you've performed for the, for, that has been commissioned by the brewers. And it's the first one, however, to look at such an evolutive period, looking at the, at the past two years. Um, and many would like to sort of see the brewing sector as a bellwether of the European economy. Would you say that that is apt? Uh, yeah, you could say that, uh, because as you, as you correctly mentioned, um, we have done three reports now, one in 2006, uh, one in 2008, and one this year. Uh, so we have a good overview, I guess, of the developments within, uh, mm -hmm. within the sector, within the industry. 
Uh, and of course, after the crisis hit, hit, uh, hit the world, uh, 2008, we also see that uh, um, the figures uh, in the brewing sector are declining. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's keeping up the trend uh, uh, with, with the global economy. So in other words, if things get better, things can go up. Yeah. That's obviously what we're, what we're here to talk about. Um, Hans Ayers, mm. how are the effects of the economic crisis being felt at the national and regional level in Germany? Uh, one, one has to distinguish between the general aspects uh, in the German economics. Uh, actually, the German economies uh, are quite robust. But uh, on the other hand, what you can see, and that uh, since years, unfortunately, there's a decline in beer consumption. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, already um, um, something what is happening since years, unfortunately. So exactly. it's not necessarily linked, in my opinion, uh, especially with regard to Germany, with the crisis, with the financial crisis. Okay, we will, we will be getting that into in a moment. Alan Clark, how are things looking for the multinational brewers in terms of the, what's your immediate outlook for the sector at the moment? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things I would say is that uh, people often refer to this crisis as a, a bit of a perfect storm, but I think it is starting to feel a bit like an endless storm. Um, that frankly, I think we are living with a new economic reality in many mm -hmm. ways. So I think the outlook for the next uh, two, three years is going to be uh, quite tough. It is going to be a challenge for the brewing sector as a whole uh, across the globe and certainly across Europe. Now, there are certainly real fears, and, and some are saying it's already happening that Europe is teetering on the brink of a double dip recession. Um, how much are you anticipating that this will happen? Yeah, I think, uh, I suppose a bit my point about the, the end of the storm, I'm not sure about the double dip because I think we're into it. You know, the the yeah. economic crisis is there, we're living with it. I think the key thing for us perhaps as brewers is that it has begun to create new habits, I think, in our, in our industry and that many of the things that we originally ascribed to the economic crisis will be with us permanently. I mean, the sharp swing of consumers, for example, from the on-premise to the mm -hmm. off-premise, the rapid consolidation of the off-premise, these things are the new reality, the way con the consumers are looking for more value and I think it is around us beginning to adapt to those new realities. And how are brewers adapting to those kinds of tough times? I think that we've, you know, we've, we've taken a while to get going. It, it has been difficult. We've, uh, we've, spent, uh, we've spent a couple of years trying to weather the storms, the, the downturn in, uh, in consumer confidence, uh, rising commodity prices, excise increases, etc. Uh, but I think interestingly now what, what we are seeing across Europe is in, in, in many ways almost ironically a, a reinvigoration of the brewing industry. We're seeing a lot of new innovation coming to the industry as of course all of the uh, the players search for value and as they begin to respond to the way consumers are looking for value in a new way so i think in some ways this has been an interesting challenge and an exciting time to uh, to live within the brewing industry because i think we're going to see a brewing industry in the next five to ten years that looks very very different from what it looked like in the past five to ten years Heinz, do you have something to add on the end of that as to how brewers are con contributing to yeah, uh, one, one, uh, let, let's come a little, back, a little bit back uh, to, to, to the uh, um, economic uh, crisis. So what one can see in, in, in Germany, actually, nobody can really explain what is happening. And, um, and, uh, you, you mean the decline in consumption? No, 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 with, the, with the economic uh, crisis, with the financial crisis. Ah, okay, from and, a citizen's um, point of view. Yeah, from okay. a citizen point of view. And there's a lot of insecurity, and uh, actually there's a run on uh, on real on investments in real estate and in in homes and apartments and and in gold. On the other hand, the uh, citizens, the people, are staying at home, and it's a German Denglish. It's called homing, and that means that they are not in the pubs. And, uh, the practice not of, of, of uh, conducting their recreation exactly. at home. Exactly. So the, the visits in, in, in the pubs are declining as well. And uh, that means especially uh, the beer consumption in the on-trade, uh, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, is declining. And uh, we really need answers. And uh, innovation is one of the part. And really looking uh, for new products and uh, to attract the consumer for new products. Now, the loss of jobs has been to the tune of over a quarter of a million between 2008 and 2010. That was exactly 12%. Given that beer consumption um, is steadily dec declining, how can the sector hope to recover? Um, 
Yeah, so uh, we really have to, to look uh, what is the change in the consumption of the consumer. And uh, what one can see, there's a bigger demand for non-alcoholic uh, beverages or beverages in, uh, with low alcohol. And um, so uh, I think that is uh, the chance for the brewers to come up with new products and uh, to come up with different flavors. Um, and um, for Germany, uh, the, the second uh, possibility, and, and one can see it uh, uh, within the last years, uh, the increase of export. Mm -hmm. So there, there seems to be a chance. Uh, the, the share of exports in, in Germany are, uh, the, the figure is roughly or approximately 16%. That uh, was an increase of uh, six percent in total uh, since the last ten years. So there's maybe a chance. Just to paint the scene, though, this decline in consumption has been a, a, a widespread thing for a number of years now. Are there other factors um, that have influenced this decline? I think that the, the reality is that if we look across uh, Europe, certainly developed Europe and Western Europe, that uh, economic or alcohol consumption broadly has been on decline for a very long time and it's, it's certainly... That would be including extends, wines and, wine and spirits. Including wine and spirits. Mm -hmm. certainly extends before the economic crisis and the same is the reality with beer. So I think for us to say that you know the, the, the total decline in, in, in beer consumption is all about the economic crisis is overstating it. I think the economic crisis has exacerbated it but we've seen for a long time this concept with people moving away from, uh, from alcohol and away from beer, away from the pubs, the restaurants, into the kind of home as cocoon and, and, and home entertainment and that, that kind of behavior. And again, I come back to the fact that I think this is a challenge that has been presented to us uh, as the brewing industry. Um, I mean, some of the, the, the references made by the speakers earlier around the fact that we're a local industry, we're a dynamic industry, uh, I think it is a challenge we can respond to. It's not all about the economic crisis. It's made it very tough, uh, but perhaps it's woken us up to some of the things we need to do. So what can policymakers do to help major employers and economic contributors like the brewers, especially in areas that have been harder hit by the crisis, as yeah, you I mentioned? Think, um, I suppose from a policymaker point of view, probably first of all would be a recognition of the contribution of, uh, of the brewers of Europe, all the brewers, the, uh, the large brewers, the small brewers. I think there is a need uh, or, a, or a hope from our side that there will be a recognition of the very real contribution we're making. Uh, secondly, I think, and, and, and our last speaker, I think it is, it is great to hear, uh, recognition of the very local nature of beer and the way mm -hmm. we touch local communities, local regions. So it's directly interacting with consumers and, uh, and society and, and, and I think that can make a, a contribution to growth. Uh, so it's a recognition of, of that and thirdly I think is a reasonableness and a predictability. I think that one of the big issues for us uh, are some of the, uh, uh, the very rapid increases in excise, for example, we've seen in, in taxation. So I mean, we realize the governments are under pressure, but a reasonable approach and a predictable mm -hmm. approach for us as an industry is important so that we can forecast our future and plan for the future. No special treatment. It's asking, I think, for what any industry and any company would be looking for. The Ernst & Young report underscores the issue of government revenues falling despite tax hikes, tax raises in taxation. Yes. Faltered of it, Greece was one of the countries that was hardest hit by the recession, obviously, and also one of the countries to increase the VAT imposed on beer. But increases like that have proven to be counterproductive. Can you tell us why is that? Uh, it's a combination of reasons, I would say. Uh, of course, in an economic crisis, when you raise taxes, that has, has a direct effect on consumption patterns by, uh, mm -hmm. by consumers. That's one reason. Um, and, and furthermore, um, uh, of course, as, my, uh, as Mr. Clark just said, uh, there's also a, a downward trend in consumption of, of alcoholic drinks that also plays a role. And the third one is, and, and that has been stressed here uh, by many people now, that you see a shift from uh, drinking in the hospitality sector towards drinking at home. And that, is, that hits uh, the beer industry really hard. Mm -hmm. because the revenues uh, which you can make through the hospitality sector mm -hmm. are much higher. Mm -hmm. and, and also the tax revenues, of course, are much higher when people spend money in the hospitality sector. So that, that those things uh, are together uh, forming the reason for, uh, for that.
and of course the recession. I, can, I cannot forget that, but that's obvious. Obviously, we, we, we can't say it enough. The EU 2020 strategy, which was also mentioned earlier on, calls for smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. And uh, the brewers are in line with this, but given these shifts in consumption patterns that we've just been talking about, people are saving money by drinking at home rather than in pubs, and the impact on jobs in the on-trade sector has been massive. How do we reconcile that with the goals of smart and sustainable growth? Who wants to answer first? Alta. Um, uh, th this, I, I think this is a very difficult question. I don't have a really, a really an answer on that one. Um, um, yeah, sustainable growth, uh, it, it seems to look at smaller brewers, uh, more small brewers uh, um, stimulating that. And, but that's what we already see happening, uh, that's already been said. What about inclusive? Yeah, what do, they, uh, what, what do they mean with that? That's, I, find, I find think this is what we'd all like to know. It's a bit of fashion term, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I find it difficult to answer this question. But. Uh, uh, I don't know what they mean with that. Uh, Alan Clark, how do you this. interpret smart growth? Yeah, I suppose smart growth really is about the, uh, the, the the world we're living in. I think consumers are demanding something different from from industry, from from all industry, and the brewers are no different. Uh, you know, whether it's a fad or not, whether these are terms that are bandied around, or whether it's real. Uh, you know, I suppose it's something we'll have to watch and monitor. But certainly, the awareness of consumers around environmental issues, around the reputation of of, uh, of companies and organisations of whole industries is, is much more acute than what it was uh, mm -hmm. a number of years ago. So smart growth, for example, to me, would mean the recognition of what consumers are looking for and the level of transparency they're looking for. So if, for example, there is, from one angle, uh, 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 an attack on the alcohol industry and the role of the alcohol industry, it is around the response of the alcohol industry in many ways, as you've seen publicized uh, this evening, around uh, transparency of our activities, transparency around the way that we are providing information to consumers, the reports we're publishing through the Brewers mm -hmm. of Europe, the commitments we're making to the EU and alcohol and, alcohol and Health Forum, which are, I think, setting a new platform for the way the industry is positioning itself to respond to consumers. So it's smart from that point of view, I think, in being very aware of the communities, governments, and uh, and population and consumers that, you de that you're dealing with and how you treat them. And then from the other point of view, I think it is about trying to find the new routes for growth and being smart in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, issues around thinking about consumption in terms of occasions and how do we get people back into the pub environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very difficult, but we should, we should acknowledge they're not gonna come back to the same kinds of pubs under the same kinds of conditions as they did in the past. So how do we reinvent ourselves as an industry and think about the way we reinvigorate the on-premise in, in our markets. I mean, very difficult to achieve, but that is also smart growth. Okay, the next question goes to both of you, but I'm going to stay with Alan just for a moment. There is a lot of talk about the need for innovation. What constitutes innovation in the brewing sector? How, how much does that apply? I, I think Hans actually touched that, on that. that. I, I think that there, there, there has been, uh, certainly I've seen in the past, you know, I've been involved in the brewing industry for 20 years and, and, and in Europe for 10 years, and certainly in the past, three, four years, I've seen an explosion of innovation, actually, and I think it's the search for growth that has begun to drive that in the industry. So, whereas in the past it was, you know, pretty much about pale lager at around 5% alcohol, uh, it is today much, much more about beer styles. We're seeing the growth of non-alcoholic beer in many sectors. We're seeing the growth of malt-based beverages as, as adult-based soft drinks. We're seeing mid-strength alcoholic beers appearing. Uh, we're seeing flavored alcoholic beers appearing, specialty beers. So, just the, the way that the, uh, the industry, and, and, and in many ways, it's, it's the small brewers who are driving this, uh, or the regional brewers who are driving this, but this, this explosion of different styles and varieties and flavor, beginning to attract a much broader consumer base back into the industry. Okay, but Hans, I'm sure you have something to say to that, because so many different styles obviously exist in Germany, but there are some pretty tough constraints. How does inno innovation apply within so, uh, no, what I already mentioned um, and, and what uh, Alan uh, um, said as well. So, uh, what, you, what you find actually in the market, there's really an explosion mm -hmm. of uh, new products uh, and, and uh, beers and, and beer mixed beverages with new flavors. And, and uh, kind of innovation, innovation really to, to attract beer uh, to the consumer, or re-attract beer to the consumer with different flavors. Younger drinkers, for instance, but I mean, are German brewers constrained by the purity laws, which obviously uh, 
are a, a, a major a major constraining <laughs> framework in your country. That's what uh, I'm getting it, at. It is, it is always said that uh, the purity, the German purity law, by the way, the oldest food law in the, in the world, uh, it, um, it was... Uh, in uh, 1516, 1516. 1516 um, it was uh, coming on, onto the table. And um, so that uh, purity law stipulates that only uh, barley, malt, uh, yeast, uh, hops and water, and water um, uh, may be used in, in, the, in the process. But uh, again, you can mix the beer with soft drinks, for example, mm -hmm. to get a mixed beverage uh, ready to go, and that is something what is happening actually in the German market. Uh, there's a uh, higher de uh, demand for this kind of, of beverages, and also uh, what, what we can see, uh, there's a trend to, to more non-alcoholic beers as well, or on uh, products which are based on a malt basis. Now, beer is closely linked to agriculture with, for example, yeah. some, I think, 20% of Europe's barley being used for beer. Um, is is that, is that particular, such uh, that, a traditional that, product? Yeah, um, that, that is quite yeah. a challenge for the time being, uh, especially be because uh, in, in Germany uh, we have to, um, we have to use at least 100% malted grain. And um, so, it, so it can for be the wheat, it can be barley, but it has to be malted. It has to be malted, and um, so it's not possible to, to use corn or something like that, or raw materials uh, like, like uh, barley so there, or something like that. There is so, uh, but it, the, the point is that this the is great. actually... I didn't even have to ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is actually the, that the farmer has an alternative. <laughs> um, so, uh, in, in, for example, in growing energy plants for uh, biofuel, and uh, th there is a big competition uh, uh, between uh, biofuel and food, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to, to grow uh, food plants. So in other words, well. energy for, for our cars to drive to the store are going to be taken away from the surface area that's available yeah, to they, actually uh, That brew. you have the possibility to drive quite cheap to the supermarket uh, where you have to buy quite expensive food. Uh, yeah. Why don't people make the link between beer and agriculture? I was hearing in conversations uh, uh, before the event, between beer and agriculture the way they do with wine. Why is the consumer not so aware that, that, that this is a traditional product that's actually a natural product as well? I think, um, so, yeah, good question. Uh, I think um, the wine uh, makers are a little bit more active for example, in describing the quality of the wine, to describe the flavor of the wine, uh, and, and uh, also talking about the uh, healthiness of, uh, of a glass of wine. And uh, I think uh, we, we, were, we are always talking about image of beer, and uh, I think we have to start also to tell more and more the story about beer and uh, about the flavor and the possibility of flavor um, which beer provides to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And um, so in, in Germany, we, uh, in, in some, uh, at some high schools, the education of beer sommeliers has been started. That's and right. I think that is a good step, really, uh, okay. to compete with the wine sommeliers. Consumer expectations on beer may be changing, as we've heard, but also on the sector as a whole when it comes to issues of sustainability and consumption and production. Alan Clark, let's just uh, step on that one more time. How important is sustainable production? Where do you see your company contributing towards those goals? I think um, sustainable production uh, today obviously extremely important. Um, I, I think there's a happy coincidence that a number of elements come together to make that uh, possible, relevant and interesting for the brewing sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first is that our sector is one that naturally lends itself to sustainable production given that so much of our, uh, of our, our, our production of course is through natural raw materials. Um, so that's the start of the sustainable production cycle. The second I think is that in our production process, clearly the use of raw materials, the use of water, carbon emissions, etc., 
reducing our footprint in that context really saves us money, so therefore it, you know, it's financial, it makes financial sense for us. And that's what I mean by the, by the happy coincidence. So I don't see a conflict. I mean, there's also, again, the, the, the innovation the that's being is, driven. The conflict is more with the competing industries. I think so, yes. I mean, they, again, you know, something like sustainable development, I mean, drives innovation. So in our industry I mean, in, or in our organisation as SAV Miller, if we set targets, I mean, it brings a challenge to our engineers, to our scientists around how are we going to meet those challenges and, again, drive some innovation within our industry. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, part of business today, I think. What about uh, German brewers? Are they doing enough in terms of satisfying consumer needs and wishes for issues of sustainability? It's very hard to, to answer so if it's enough. Um, at least um, the, the question is uh, how, to, how to convert uh, the decline into an increase in, in beer, uh, beer consumption. And um, so it's, it's a hard work and, and uh, I think more innovation is at least necessary. And, uh, Maybe also um, uh, really um, to to improve the communication with the com uh, with the consumer. I'm sure that's a major challenge for you, seeing as you're sitting in the country with the most brewers in Europe. Uh, that's right. Over yeah. 1,300. Yes. How well you haven't been at the job very long, but how easy or how difficult is it to stay on top of it all in terms <laughs> of where? Yeah. Resource efficiency, applying that to over 1,300 breweries. Um, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's a really challenging job, to be honest. Uh, but uh, I'll have to ask but you to, back next year. But uh, on <laughs> <laughs> please do it. Uh, but again, so um, okay, we have big breweries, we have small breweries, but but uh, all breweries are facing the same subject, mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, these subjects are uh, alcohol politics. These are t taxations. Uh, this is the image of beer, and uh, this is uh, changing in legislation. And um, then uh, we, we don't have to uh, differentiate between small breweries and big breweries because, again, they're facing all the same issue. A question for our economist who gets to be our, our realist in times of crisis when economic upswing is obviously vital. Walter De Witt, is a sustainable future compatible with a thriving economy? Coming back to the idea of smart growth, or, or is, is economy obviously going to be the first thing on the agenda? Are we going to see? No, I don't. I think sustainability will remain on the agenda. And I think industry and most companies will see also the benefits of sustainable production. And like in the beer industry, obvious, one of the big things is saving on water mm -hmm. when producing beer. And I think most of the brewers are really working on that. And I think that will also remain a, a trend uh, and, and, and something big in the industry. Now let's just quickly get back to this idea of inclusive growth. Just last month, the European Commission published a new policy on corporate social responsibility and put forward a new definition of CSR as the responsibility of enterprises for their impacts on society. And on that note, I'd just like to reintroduce the other report that I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the discussion, the May 2011 Community Involvement Report, which is was commissioned by the Brewers of Europe for the very first time. The first time you've done this kind of an examination. Hans, as tell us some of the ways in which brewers support local communities. Um, so, um, as you mentioned, we have a lot of breweries in, in Germany, and, and the, that, that means that they really have a regional link to the consumer, to the citizen. And uh, there's a lot of uh, sponsors, uh, sponsorship around the chimney of a brewery. Um, it's, it's part of the marketing of a brewery, for sure. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it also helps uh, really to facilitate, um, uh, to, to, have, uh, as, uh, to have the events and, and, uh, and also to support sports uh, and, and so on uh, around the chimney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> round the chimney, um den Schornstein. Um den Schornstein, round the chimney of the brewery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how is it. That's, maybe that's it's very German. Yeah, that's okay. an idiomatic expression. Obviously, it okay, means with, a, within the within the immediate radius yeah, of, the, okay. of the brewery. I'm sorry, yeah. Alan Clark. Some examples from Sad Miller of social responsibility that go beyond the basic uh, job of brewing. You know, I suppose, well, as a as a global as a, uh, as as a multinational a, as a global brewer, I guess that would take many forms from uh, from the kind of. 
uh, the activities that are more global in reach, such as, for example, getting involved in water footprinting in, uh, in Asia, mm. such as, for example, farming development. And we have extensive work uh, we've been doing on farming development in, uh, in Africa, our work on HIV and AIDS in much of the developing world. So you have those elements. Uh, but then you bring it all the way back down to the local operations. Uh, for example, in Europe, where we have uh, our Polish company, which runs a, a very nice basic program around how to bring people out of poverty and alleviate poverty for those most badly affected in that society and the way they've affected the lives of 12,000 people living in poverty over the past couple of years. So it's from the very large kind of more, I suppose, impactful down to something which is very basic and touches the heart of a local community, which mm -hmm. uh, is the responsibility of companies such as ours. Now, European brewers play a crucial role, obviously, in supporting cultural, sporting, and all of these types of events to the tune of 1 billion euros a year, as was uh, uh, discovered in this report. And yet there have been calls to ban beer sponsorships. Obviously, what impact would that have on local and regional governments when they are strapped for cash? Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think that would be unfortunate. Uh, you know, one can see that trend. We've seen it, of course, with, with, with other products. So I think that, again, you know, the, the, we're all very familiar, I suppose, as television viewers in particular with the major global sponsorship. And, of course, that is... That is big money for uh, for many uh, for many sports, but probably even in some ways more importantly, it's around the local sports, the local sports teams, the local clubs uh, that are sponsored so much. And and you see, I mean, because of the nature of the product beer, that it is a social product, it is about small groups getting together, having a good time together. Uh, it is very often associated with just you know clubs at a very local level, and so that kind of grassroots activity, I think that would really be a pity to see that disappear in time. Mm -hmm. And. Perhaps we can just quickly before, I know everybody's dying to have a beer and we even have some up here. If we can just conclude perhaps back to this issue of taxation and um, for that I'll turn once again to our tax expert, Walter de Witt. What support do you think the brewers can expect from government and policymakers to help this sector fully recover and grow in know. the short term? Let's, 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 be up, let's just I can't say what the they can expect because these are difficult times, but uh, what would be good for them is, uh, and I think uh, Mr. Clark also said that, uh, to have certainty about the future and what we, have seen, <laughs> what we have seen in the past few years that, for example, in the EU, 27 EU member states, 15 have uh, increased their excise duty rates on mm -hmm. beer and 13 have increased VAT rates. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's of course to a certain extent uh, understandable in the current crisis, but it's also, and that I think they should take more account of that, it can be also a disaster for an industry which uh, already is going through tough times. And we saw it, um, even though tax increases were there, um, the total revenue of governments has fallen. So well, the question so much is, of the tax how effective revenue. is this? So much of the tax revenue yeah. is actually yeah, coming it, from income tax. Yeah, yeah. So when the jobs go, so does yeah. the revenue. Yeah, exactly. And we saw uh, in the last two years from 58 million mm. billion uh, revenue in two years to 50 billion. To 50 billion. So that's a lot of money. Lots of work to do. Alan Clark, could policymakers be doing more in the immediate term to get the balance right? I think so, I and mean, I think there has been, after the initial uh, couple of years, there's been, I think, a more reasonable and a more balanced approach. So I think, again, we, we need to give credit to the, uh, the national governments for that, um, and I, I suppose a much more cautious approach to, to this and the, the overall impact it is, uh, it is having. Um, but sure, I mean, they could continue to be more, I think, by working with us, engaging with us, uh, and, in, and in particular, again, I make the point around the predictability uh, that we, we need to be, have, be able to have to manage our businesses. Hans, Ayers, any, any comments on your expectations from policymakers in the immediate term? Uh, for, for me, it's uh, quite important really to prevent uh, the distortion or possible distortion of competition, especially with regard uh, to the agricultural aspects and um, especially uh, uh, what, what I see quite critical is, is the subsidies of, uh, of energy plants, of, of the growth of biofuel. Of, of biofuel mm -hmm. and, uh, I think um, that, that will lead at least in, in a mismatch, and um, so that would be my position uh, to the politician. Okay, and finally, I'm going to go out on a tiny bit of a limb here and ask our two brewers, and I'll start with you, Alan, if you had your life to do over again, you did start off in psychology, would you become a brewer? 
I saw the light and uh, there's no doubt. I mean, what a profession. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, of course, yes. And Hans, I don't, yeah, I don't even know it's, if I... It's, it's very simple. I love beer and therefore, uh, yes, for sure. <laughs> I, would, I would do it again. That's good news. We've got committed, committed uh, Mitch Streiter here. Ladies and gentlemen, we can definitely open up to the floor for questioning. If there are a few questions, we have gone a bit over time, so I'd like to keep it short. Maybe we have a beer. We, we will have a beer. Are there, any, are there any burning questions from the floor, or can they wait until our panelists get down? On that note, I think it's time for us to say cheers. Thank you all for being cheers. here. We'll, uh, <laughs> thank you to our panelists. Cheers. 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 Post to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to wrap things up. I think we've established that a healthy brewing sector makes a vital and social, a vital social and economic and, and cultural contribution to the whole of the EU, and that a pint of beer in a pub obviously goes a long way in terms of benefits for the value chain. And hopefully policymakers will be taking note that it can play a key role in Europe's economic recovery and also help re-establish consumer trust with an image that conveys tradition, commitment and conviviality. So cheers to all of you and thank you very much gentlemen for joining me up here. You are free to step down. Thanks. And Thanks we'll just, we've got just a few more things on the agenda. Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs>